data gene website. So that'll yeah. be fun. Thanks. We might, uh, we might kick it off, I reckon, guys. Um, conscious yeah. of yep. people's um, precious time. Uh, so I'd like to open uh, just by wishing everyone a good afternoon and, and welcome to this uh, Breeding Briefs webinar. Uh, this is the last webinar in series two of Breeding Briefs. Um, if you have missed a past episode, don't worry, you can do some binge watching if you wish. Um, just go to the Data Gene uh, website and you might be able to find uh, some previous um, Breeding Briefs if you want to have a, a, look, at, a look there. Um, I'd like to also welcome today's uh, co-host, uh, Vaughn Johnson. Um, through his role at as the CMEX National Sales Manager, Vaughn has a unique insight into the needs of dairy businesses right around the country. Um, Vaughn goes that extra mile, which we're so thankful for, by putting his time into the Genetic Evaluation Standing Committee. Um, now that committee is a group of farmers and industry people, scientists, um, data gene staff, that has re really been the driving force behind the National Breeding Objective Review, which is the focus of today's uh, webinar. Now in this webinar, Vaughn and I will get to have a chat about the changes that are upon us and what they might mean for you and, and your business. Now, welcome Vaughn. Thanks Michelle. So if we think about breeding over time, I suppose our needs change as we continue to try and breed the right type of cow uh, for our businesses. Um, and as farmers, I suppose it's not too similar to, to others, we want to make improvements really across a whole range of traits. We, we're wanting to improve lots of things at the same time. Uh, and an index, such as the Balanced Performance Index or Health Weighted Index, uh, help us balance the competing needs. Now, to get that balance right, uh, we combine traits based on the economic value of each of those traits to our dairy businesses. Uh, but of course, economic inputs change over time. Um, the cost of labor increases, uh, feed costs change, um, the value of milk components change as examples. So the National Breeding Objective Review, which I mentioned was overseen by the Genetic Evaluation Standing Committee, um, it takes input from scientists. And in this case, we uh, worked with a team from Dairy Bio, from Abacus Bio in New Zealand and the Data Gene group of scientists. And this review kind of uh, undertook to consult to understand what are the key issues that people are talking about that we needed to address in terms of um, updates to indices. And if you remember, well, might not remember, but um, back a year ago, that original discussion paper was um, published uh, back in November of 2019. And after that uh, initial discussion paper was released, we had the opportunity to survey um, farmers and industry researchers, service providers to gather a broad range of opinion uh, throughout December 19 and, and January 2020 uh, in pre-COVID uh, times. Um, after that, we had uh, undertook a review of the economic inputs and made some updates to the genetic parameters uh, to make sure that we're keeping in touch with um, how the populations are evolving in Australia over time. Um, Following that, an options paper, which detailed some of the ways that we could address those um, key issues that people had uh, picked up, uh, that was uh, distributed. And we had the opportunity to chat about that. And I see many of the people that are on the call today uh, were also people that were involved in that consultation period um, in the middle of the year. Um, that led to some decisions around July from the committee and a rollout uh, from November. And so some people on the call might have even seen um, the routine ABVs released in November uh, that have the new indices included. So the changes that we present today really are addressing the needs of farmers in our industry, uh, responding to that analysis of the market signals um, backed by robust science. And I think that's important to kind of highlight. Um, one of the things that was really uh, kind of rewarding to see, I suppose, is that through the survey and through the consultation, there's a strong level of support for BPI. Uh, so we see this as, you know, perhaps more of an update rather than wholesale change. And so with that context in mind, um, it's probably a good chance to think about what's actually changing. So the first key change from the review is that the type weighted index has been removed. Um, after monitoring feedback from farmers and from industry, 
um, it's, it was clear that the type weighted index just really wasn't doing what it was meant to do. Um, and so it's been replaced with a direct approach, which is just to list the top type and memory system bulls in the good bulls guide. Now, Vaughn, this is something that you've um, had the opportunity to kind of think about. Um, could you perhaps just uh, tell us a little bit about your involvement in the review so far and, and perhaps extend to think about um, what your views were around this, um, the TWI and where it sits? Yes, thank you, Michelle. Um, I guess um, it's pretty, through the Genetic Standing Committee, you get uh, insight through the whole period of the process from 12 months ago. Uh, to where we are today and it's quite a robust discussion and it takes in all um, aspects of the decisions that have been made and then recommended to get to the final decision um, and and this time I think um, you know really it was very robust looking at the response to selection uh, the survey and the and the really participation from breeders uh, farmers resellers uh, industry bodies things like that so very thorough process and really when we look at when the BPI was implemented five years ago, it's had a, had a particularly strong increase uh, in the market and well received. Um, so now really we're starting to see reviews of the indexes and what's being making the market penetration. Um, and really it was evident uh, through this NBO peer, peer, uh, process that the three indexes were very similar and they needed to be very different in the way, what they presented to farmers to, um, for the farmers. For a TWI uh, perspective, it was evident that really an index was probably over, over complicating things and the overall type list uh, and memories, a list of those bulls from the good bull guy, guys would be adequate to serve the market needs. Um, and that's what we're really seen and come to that to decision that it would be, it's not taking away that type of memory systems aren't important. It just means that these bulls will be ranked according to what people's wants and needs are. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Vaughn. Um, you mentioned, you know, about that kind of robust discussion that's been held. Um, we're not going to cover all of the detail of the full discussion uh, but if you're interested in getting into some detail certainly reach out to the people at data gene or um, hop onto the website because those publications are still available for people to have a look at if you want to get into the results of the survey and things because um, that was um, is quite insightful so it was really that was good value yeah thanks thanks Vaughn. Um, so if we get into kind of, uh, I suppose, the, the two indices that we'll be working with going forward being the BPI, the Balanced Performance Index, and the HWI, the Health Weighted Index, there are some changes underway um, that are taking place for those two indices. Um, in broad terms, the economic values, particularly for fat and for protein, for feed and for labor, have been updated. And that has an impact then on the economic weights of traits within those indices. There's been additional emphasis on health and fertility, but the amount of emphasis and the weightings are different for BPI and for HWI. And we're gonna go into some more detail about those um, in a minute. The last change that might be worthwhile to note at this stage is, is about the base. So there was a review of the base done as part of the uh, process. Um, there's been no change to the years of birth of the animals that we call average. So the animals that were in the group called average before are the same sort of animals that will be called average uh, from now on. But uh, there has been a little filter applied so that only purebred animals are included in that group called average. And um, that's particularly relevant, I think, for, for jerseys especially. So ducking into the balanced uh, performance index, um, what's changed? So there's more emphasis on the health traits. Uh, when we add extra emphasis on something, um, that does mean just by simple mechanics that you have to lose a bit of emphasis on something else. And where that's been pulled from is, is really on the production uh, side. So there's more emphasis on health traits and less emphasis on, on production. Uh, 
this has included um, the inclusion of the survival ABV, or which is a measure of, of longevity. Um, it's in the index now in its own right. And the new trait, mastitis resistance ABV, is also now in the BPI and HWI. So these are some of the ways in which um, there's been an increase in those um, health, health traits. Uh, uh, just a note on the on the jersey. So one of the kind of interesting parts of this review is um, a greater investigation and, and learning more about how indices are applied in different breeds, particularly the, the three most populous breeds, Holsteins, Jerseys, and Red Breeds. And in working with the uh, crew at Jersey Australia and, and Jersey Breeders, um, one thing that we learned was that the feed saved breeding value um, wasn't fitting so well in the BPI for jerseys. It's evaluated differently for that breed. Um, there's a, a, a discord between um, feed saved ABV and the desire to increase the size of the jersey breed. And as a result, that feed saved ABV is not included in the BPI for the jersey breed. So Vaughan, well, just thinking about the changes that are happening to BPI, um, what do you think is meaningful here Do you think for, for end users? Yeah, so I guess we've probably got people on the call that are, uh, have started to see their lists of animals. If you're genotyping or a bull company, you would have started to see some lists. And uh, we anticipated bulls that would be, we would benefit from the new index for fertility, um, mastitis and survival. And so the new list, we really see that coming through evidently. Um, that's And that's exactly what the uh, NBO was from a farmer perspective is what they wanted. So we're seeing favorable um, impact on those bulls to arise. You're seeing a little bit higher, bigger range on the BPI. So some bulls above 500, um, but really the BPI is answering what the farmers want in the fact that they're looking for more survival health traits and mastitis. Um, so we can see that some of the more popular bulls get to the top of the list in these traits are very strong, um, which is favorable in our opinion. Yep, great. Yeah, that's interesting, Vaughn. It's nice to see uh, the the um, the aim, <laughs> uh, the desires that that farmers were expressing, kind of uh, turn into reality in terms of what the list looked like. Which yeah, is and it, and it, and obviously the BPI is an index, so we you got to also understand that there will be bulls that or clients or customers um, that will have traits that are priorities for them and they won't necessarily be in the top 10. They'll still be in the list in the Good Bulls Guide, but we'll just have to filter those traits as we do so much of now to be able to find the desired bull that the, the end user wants. So they're in the list. Um, you do see a bit of movement around, but they're not dropping completely off the list. It's just more hovering towards bulls that are stronger in the health traits and longevity. Yep. I'll just yep. ask a question there on that. And of course, without divulging any names, of course, but you can tell me this, the, the top 10 at the stands at the moment um, for each index, how many bulls would be in the same group? Like how many top 10 BPI bulls are featured in the top 10 HWI bulls? So ah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, that's a good point, Eric. Can I actually come back? Drop out, you know, because we need two separate groups. Yeah. Yep. Can I come back to that a little bit? Okay. Um, just because yep. that'll give me the chance to kind of explain the HWI and the changes there. Um, but it's a, a, a great point that we'll pick up just as soon as we um, um, just highlight the changes that are made to the HWI, because I think it'll become clear. Uh, but good question, um, Eric. So skipping through to the uh, health weighted index. Um, the health weighted index is quite a bit different now to the BPI, mostly through um, a doubling of the weight on fertility. Um, so the, you still will find a few bulls that are, you know, in the top group for BPI and in the top group for HWI, but there's more re-ranking between those two lists compared to where we were um, in 2015. Um, and I think Vaughan, um, uh, this kind of feels right in comparison to the, the survey results that we were receiving from, from farmers where um, one criticism was that those lists previously were too, were too similar. Does that right. sound about right to you? Yeah, there was certainly a, a want and need for the, the indexes to be different, um, but in a different, in a positive way that health weighted index was was very focused on health. So um, it's really aimed at breeding healthy, smaller, more efficient animals. And um, and so you can see the differences in the list, which um, I think has achieved that. Um, and you there'll be 
portions of the market that will prefer a BPI or HWI more than we, we were probably seeing before the NBO. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other part that helps us, Eric, just in sort of picking apart the differences between HWI and BPI is looking at sort of the response to selection. Now, just walking through what this graph um, means. So the response to that selection is uh, how much gain do we expect to achieve over the next three generations, per se, in different traits, if we apply one or other of the two indices um, that will be published. So if we use BPI as our main selection tool, or we use HWI as our main selection tool, we're going to come up with a different result. So one way of quantifying the difference in results is by looking at each trait individually and saying, how much faster am I going to go or how much slower am I going to go um, if I apply either the BPI, which is the blue column, or the BPI, the blue column, or HWI, the green column, for a trait like protein. So in this particular case, we can see that while there has been an increase in emphasis on health and fertility traits, we're still achieving some decent gains for protein using the BPI. In the, if we use the HWI, yes, we're still going to gain a little bit for protein over time, but the scale of that improvement is much, much smaller um, compared to the BPI. And this reflects the differences in weights between those two indices. If we take a trait like fertility, for example, the story is a little bit different. In both indices, we're making gains, and that's important. But the health weighted index is probably is making faster gains um, than, than the BPI. And so I'll just give you a second to have a look at that graph, because the traits that you're interested in um, are, might be different amongst this group. Uh, so just have a look and see what is different between the BPI and the HWI uh, between um, for, for each for each trait. And Vaughn, I'd be interested in your um, perspectives about some traits on this graph that you might find particularly interesting or ones that your clients you think might, um, might want to focus on um, and any differences that you notice between the two indices. I think it'll come up after. I think there's another slide that shows you some of the things, but you probably didn't highlight the feed saved. The feed saved is a trait that's being released around the world in different countries now and Australia has been a leader in that trait. Um, and so HWI really, if you look at that, has a, um, a significant response in selection over in through this. So it's, um, it's also yeah. a trait that does um, probably command. So it, you will see a difference. There's obviously less type overall type in the HWI, which you would imagine that to be correct. Um, so it really sort of, sort of, paints the picture for what you're going to expect from these indexes. Yeah. That's a really good point, um, Vaughn, about feed saved. Um, so the, um, the, you know, there's a, there's a full weight, if you will, on, on feed saved in, in the health weighted index, but uh, not so much uh, on, the, on the BPI. Um, a little bit more than what it was before, but um, if you're looking to really push feed saved, um, you'll get more out of that from, uh, from the health weighted index. I'm a little bit surprised the uh, survival is so close, but then again, I guess you've got to remember the BPI is also taking you forward for fertility and cell count and all these things as well. It's just the yeah. HWI is doing it a little bit more. Yeah, that's right, Eric. It's just supercharged really in the HWI, but recognizing that um, longer lasting cows, cows are getting in calf are important economically, um, and the balanced performance index is trying to balance the um, health and fertility and the production all in kind of an, an, a, 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 in a way that achieves the best yeah. performance from cows overall. So let's look at some animal movements in our Eric, and I think this um, will get a little bit to your point as well um, in terms of what we would expect to see uh, both on cow lists and on, on bull lists. Uh, in the Holstein side, uh, the top animals for BPI will be, uh, you know, more distinctly different to the top animals from HWI. Now, we know that there are some special animals that can do well across both, but um, we will see um, more different lists um, across the two. Uh, the top Holsteins will be breaking that 500 BPI um, barrier. Uh, there is some re-ranking 
uh, and if you think about where some of that re-ranking might happen, if we think about animals that are particularly strong for, for survival, for longevity, for fertility, for mastitis resistance, for cell count, those animals will probably push ahead a little bit in the rankings. Um, animals that are, were really strong for production and not so strong for those health and fertility traits, uh, in comparison, they're likely to pull back a little bit in the rankings. Um, probably still good bulls, but they won't be uh, highlighted as much as those ones um, that have um, maybe a little bit better in the health and, and uh, fertility area. Uh, sorry, just going back to Vaughn, uh, just your comments about um, you, know, you know movements that you've seen so far, some observations that you wanted to add here. Yeah, so you, I mean, we're still when we look at the list, really, it's a, the bulls that we see benefit uh, in BPI in particular is the bulls that have that survival, fertility, mastitis resistant traits, or even females that really win through the new index. Um, so we do see some bulls moving around from the top of the list, but they don't drop completely away. They're still there. But bulls that you can see rank well on both are particularly strong in those traits, which you would understand why they would rank well. Um, obviously, um, it's really the same sort of comments around longevity, fertility and mastitis, uh, resistance, cell count, that sort of thing. Uh, those are the bulls that benefit. You don't see a completely different, when we say there's some re-ranking, re it's not a completely new list. There's some popular bulls in the market and females that still get to the top. Um, it's just a re-ranking, which we see most, uh, most rounds these days. Terrific. And on the, on the Jersey side, um, again, we'll start to see some more distinct lists between the HWI and the BPI list uh, for Jersey cows and bulls. Um, and the, the top elite group of, of Jersey animals will be breaking that 400 BPI um, barrier. And this is really driven from um, the higher uh, price of milk, essentially. Um, so um, there's been uh, yeah, price, uh, milk's worth a little bit more, and so um, we see a bit of a scaling effect happen with the BPI across um, across the different breeds. Uh, some re-ranking, uh, but this, the, you know the top BPI animals are still mostly top BPI um, animals. They just might be um, in a uh, in the top twenty rather than they be in the in the top ten. And so there, red... is, there, there is an increase on the on the BPI level for those jerseys as well. I think yes. it's important to note that there is a significant increase to the high BPI bulls. Um, they're not quite, they're, they're probably still below the Holsteins, but we do see an increase of the BPI um, yeah. across the top animals. Yeah, that's 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 a good point, Vaughan, because look, looking at what's changed as, as well, we're, we're actually including survival now in both indices, so BPI and so survival, even though we, we have calculated survival for a long time, uh, it wasn't included in the indices, but a lot of the, the change you'll see can be attributed to actually adding survival in basically as a new trait to the indices. And on the red breeds, um... Look, the, the, the differences between BPI and HWI will be a little bit more muted in red breeds just because of the population size. So we're, we're re-ranking the same bulls um, on, uh, on those two lists. Um, but there is a, a, a greater difference between the, in the list than there was before. Um, and the top reds are in that uh, territory of 350 or so BPI um, units. Now, importantly, uh, you know, if we think about breeding from a strategic point of view, um, being clear about what our breeding goals are, identifying the index that we want to use as our primary uh, selection tool from which we can apply the filters uh, according to our own business uh, needs, I think is a really useful first step in having a good solid breeding strategy in place. Um, so in, in summary, that BPI, it's that balance of traits that affect our uh, farm business performance. Um, you know, balancing production, fertility, longevity, health, workability, and type. It's based on the, the preferences of most farmers that we understand through this survey and past surveys as well. Um, backed by strong science, uh, uses current economic values, uh, and has that little difference that between jerseys and other breeds uh, in that it's reflected those breed specific priorities around feed saved for, for jerseys. And that's a bit in contrast to the health weight index, which really fast tracks uh, fertility and, and health. Um, it is 
going to help us hold production, but not really improve it very quickly in terms of, um, you know, strictly milk yield per, per cow. Uh, and if you're wanting to improve feed efficiency more quickly, uh, it's, it's probably the index that's going to do that the best. It's got the uh, strongest response to selection for, for feed saved. Uh, and it's also where we might see some differences in terms of cow size. Uh, we're not going to see animals getting much bigger um, using the health weighted index. And in fact, uh, they might come back a little bit in, in terms of cow size over a period of time. Does the bull get uh, any points for being short of stature or is it coming through the feed saved index? Yeah, so, so stature contributes to live weight, which is part of the feed saved story. So very tall statured animals are expected to be heavier animals um, and therefore require more feed for maintenance. And that is a cost in terms of the evaluation of, of feed saved. So just in summary, if you think about changes over time, uh, many of you on this call, we've, we've been here before in terms of changes of indexes, and you've seen this story happen both here in Australia and around the world, the move from, uh, you know, purely production only indices to something that is much better balanced in terms of the um, traits that contribute to, uh, to um, a, the performance of a cow and therefore performance of a herd. Um, so that production component, which is the blue um, piece in the column on the far right hand side in 2020 is uh, just over 40%, 40 or 44% um, in, in Holsteins. Whereas the green area, uh, survival, cell count mastitis, um, fertility is, is taking them a much um, larger section, has more impact um, than uh, the previous indices. And I think that's um, just part of the uh, expected changes that we would see in, in breeding trends globally um, over time. And, and I, I think with that too, Michelle, on, on that uh, previous graph, is it really indicates that the, the profit or the money that comes from those other traits now, doesn't it? It's not just production only. Yep, yep. We save costs by having uh, longer lasting, more fertile cows. Yep. yep. Um, and just, uh, I, uh, I want to make sure we've got some time for some questions sort of here, but I, just before we finish up, I wanted just to highlight something that was changing about the feed saved ABV also in the December release. Um, we're very fortunate in Australia to have uh, the capacity of researchers at Dairy Bio. And uh, through that, we have um, some new information related to feed saved. So some new data has been contributed uh, to the evaluation of feed saved. Um, the data for feed saved is really, it's expensive. Um, it's tricky to get. It's really only able to be generated from research stations, both in Australia and other parts of the world. Uh, so some extra new information about feed saved is available from those research um, stations and some slight improvements to the model. Uh, the impact means that we have a 10% or so 11% um, increase in the reliability of feed saved uh, for Holstein um, bulls. And uh, I think for a trait that is still relatively new and improving, um, it's an important one for us. Uh, and to see an improvement to the reliability, I think is a great step forward. Uh, Vaughn, you've been thinking about feed saved a little bit because um, Australia uh, has had this around for a few years, but uh, uh, other countries are also thinking about this, this trait. Um, what does 11% do you think mean to farmers? Well, I think when you have a, any trait that increases reliability of a significant 10%, it's um, worthy of implementation. So it was pretty easy for the genetic committee to roll through this, to release this in December. Um, we're seeing feed saved or traits like this um, throughout the world being released. And in the US, we see feed save released this December. So we are ahead of the curve as far as that is concerned. But what doesn't, isn't in the slide, um, I said I'm, previous before this call was the interesting part for me is it is a heritable trait of um, of quite significant, um, much higher than some of the health traits. So if we do select for it, we will get a huge improvement over the next 10 years. It's probably not understood as much as it should be at the farm gate level um, in the resale things like that, there's probably some uh, improvement for understanding of the trait. And it's still got a long way to go, um, but it will have significant benefit over the next 10 years and will increase the demand uh, moving forward. Can I ask what uh, what's that figure now? If it's improved by 11%, what is it? 
what's the what's the reliability percentage? Uh, that's a good. Uh, for most animals, Michelle, uh, they'll, they'll move up from low 30s, so 32% up into the mid 40s. So a really good spot, and it was um, for those that look at data vat, uh, if you look at your animal, be it bull or cow, if you press compare proof button, that favourite button of mine, Michelle, the compare proof, uh, it actually shows you the difference in reliability on feed saved. And it's generally running at about 8 to 13%, Eric, which is really good. So it, it shows you the increase in or the decrease in feed save value, but it shows you the change in reliability. And it's, it's quite impressive, actually. I, I think... Uh, For genomically tested animals, yeah. I think it's going to be interesting like they're doing a fair bit of work on this in Denmark too, watching cows, you know, with 3D cameras and that. I think it's going to have impact when farmers and children are going to find these genes that are out there when you've got two animals of the same size. Yep. And yet one's... Because um, now people just seem to assume, ah, oh, it's just about cow size. Well, yep. we're hoping that it won't be just about that. It'll be about two animals the same size and one uh, has a lot better, uh, better saved feed. That's when people will start to take notice of it. Yeah, and, and if you look, Eric, too, the thing that's limited on every farm, every farm any one of us will go to, the thing that's limited is feed. So it's not water, it's not anything else, it's feed. So we need to make as much value or, you know, efficiency with the feed that's there. So I think it'll be, a, as Vaughan said, it'll be a trait to the future, this one. Yeah, I think so. I think it'll, it'll get more and more legs as it goes on for sure. So stick with it, guys. I think, uh, Michelle, um, yep alluded to the cost of generating a composite or a trait like feed saved is very expensive. Um, now that we have countries starting to collaborate better, um, genomics has, has a massive input and, and moving forward with technology, we have the opportunity to make better advancements with traits like feed save. So up until now, we probably haven't been in the position to be able to real get, get a lot of momentum in genetic merit for traits like feed saved. Um, without technology so it's important that we see that and uh we'll see big improvements and benefit because of that terrific um thanks very much guys a great discussion about uh that trait and its improvements um over time uh the changes that we see to feed saved um and as well as changes to the bpi and hwi you can find these uh, when you look up animals on Databat or in December, the Good Bulls app. Um, and Pete's already put in a great plug for the compare ABV feature of Databat, which is um, quite handy to be able to kind of um, look at individual changes for each trait, for each animal, regardless of whether it's a cow or a bull. Uh, and if you're looking for some more information, I've skimmed through the uh, review process. Um, there are quite a few documents there if you want to go back in and look at some detail there. There are some brand new fact sheets and tech notes that describe the changes that are uh, underway for the indices, as well as the improvements to feed saved. So the datagene.com.au website um, has really got a, a, a pretty wealthy library these days of uh, tech notes, fact sheets, and uh, farmer case studies. Uh, so take a look there if you're looking for some background um, information. And er Eric, the um, updated re reliabilities of the feed saved is in the tech note that's on the website. I tried to cut and paste it into chat, but I failed. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Uh, and just finally, just a, a, a call and a thank you to those that help us to get to this point. Um, it, you know, Vaughn, the work of the Genetic Evaluation Standing Committee to kind of lead this process is really important. It's a great um, opportunity for minds from different perspectives to meet uh, all with the same goal in mind about delivering the best breeding values we can to Australian farmers. Um, we also have uh, the research that we've noted today uh, coming to us from uh, Dairy Bio uh, with good support in terms of funding from, from Gardner Foundation, from the likes of Dairy Australia, uh, and the data suppliers, which many of you are on this call, um, that supply information to us, uh, be it from farm, uh, classifiers that are providing information around uh, linear type evaluations, bull committees that support those uh, programs, um, herd test centers, genomic service providers, and, and dairy data software providers are all really important to making uh, these initiatives um, come, to, come to life. So thank you very much for that. I think we've got a few minutes for questions, Leanne, if we're, I know we're five minutes over one o'clock, but maybe we can take one or two uh, before we head off today. 
Uh, well, yes, Michelle, you'll have to unmute everyone. I can't do it today. Uh, okay, let me stop sharing. Hello. Um, I can hear whoever it was that was speaking. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yep, yes, I can we can hear you, hear you Eric, but yep. everyone else is still muted and got their cameras off. So maybe you start with yours, Eric, your question. Yeah, yeah I think maybe because I've got two screens here. Okay. I think people now can unmute yourselves um, and ask a question anytime you want to. Okay. We're on? Yep, go for it. Yes, I was just wondering, you gave some numbers on BPI, where the top groups sit. Can you give us that for HWI? Uh, yep, good question. Um, I don't actually have that list right in front of me at the moment. Pete, the, do you have it the, there? The HWI uh, numbers are just a bit bigger than BPI. So, uh, so the top HWI animals will actually be a slightly bigger number than the BPI. Right, so it's not a, so you could say they're 530 plus or something, the whole thing. You could say that, yep. Okay, so that's higher. All right. All right, that'll do. Thanks, Eric. Anyone else? Just speak up. I can't quite see everyone to put your hand up and stuff, so you might just have to jump in and say hello. I see Brian Anderson. Brian, have, have you got a question from... Um... Gippsland. Everyone's uh, still muted. Yeah, people can unmute themselves. Um, so just press your unmute button if you want to ask a question. Which just move your mouse and it's the bottom left hand corner. I think just okay. just just a, a comment to you, Eric. Too, I, I think you're you're very pleased to see the two indices move apart a little, too, aren't you? Oh well, of, of course. You know that that it makes them both valuable. Then, and uh, it'll be just interesting if if the health weighted is a bigger number. I know it sounds a bit silly, I suppose, but will people farmers tend to look more at the bigger number? But I shouldn't do. I mean, but I think it's good that there'll be different. Um, different bulls represented in each group and not that you'd want any of those bulls to far fall too far away from the top in either index either, either but it'll be good if there's a good mix of bulls in the top 10 that, that are quite different you know number two in hwi might be number you know 11 on bpi something like that i think that that'll be yep. good if it's yep. like and, that it should be good and I, I think vaughn made the comment too being privy to looking at some of the information on his bulls that it's certainly not an upending vaughn is it like the 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 top bulls across old and new indices are still there it's just that you do see some specialist bulls bobbing up to make things a bit interesting isn't it yeah that's right like it's yeah certainly we see some movement of, of some of our bulls around which is no different than any proof round for a time to time we see chat a changes quite regularly um, in this case if you've got bulls at the top you'll probably have bulls at the top anyway they're just maybe a little bit different but we don't see a bull dropping from from the top number one spot down to the bottom either so it's not going to be drastic changes it's just going to be bulls that are particularly good in certain traits will be the bulls you see or females see move to the top of the list Yep. And, and once you look at your results, particularly with that compare proof button on data that you can actually see where they've done well and uh, where they haven't done so well. So it's really quite ex self-explanatory there. You can you can see exactly why animals have moved up or down relative to each other. Thank you very much, guys. It's been terrific to have your contribution today, Vaughn. Uh, thanks very much for co-hosting. Uh, Pete, Leanne, thank you very much for your support and assistance with the um, webinar today. Lovely to see you online. Um, and if you do think that someone else in your organization could see value in this webinar, let them know that, um, that it's available on the uh, Data Gene website uh, to refer back to if you need to. Um, thanks very much and have a fantastic uh, day. Um, lovely to uh, see you all again.